this video, I'm going to showcase a constructed language, a conlang that I've spent the last month or so creating. The language isn't complete by any means, though I'm not sure exactly what that would entail. The name of the language I've decided is Denam or Denam Samanga, meaning language of skill or art, or simply artlang, because that's what it is, an artlang though with the purpose of demonstrating simplicity and internationality, it bears some resemblance to an auxiliary language. Simplicity was the foremost priority, and the simplest place to start is with simple phonology and phonotactics. In my philosophy, simplicity also facilitates disambiguation in communication, and as such I wanted to bake that simplicity into the orthography along with its internationality. This is why I designed the phonology and orthography concurrently. I also find that elegance can invite simplicity, and vice versa, so I started with the simplest shape I could think of. A circle. I considered what a circle consists of, four curves, or rather a single curve in four different orientations. With four different orientations of a curve, and a whole circle, we already have five fairly distinct symbols. Counter to my philosophy of simplicity, the phonological designation of each symbol will always be essentially arbitrary. For the orthography, I took a lot of inspiration from Korean Hangul, but the reduction of shapes is not conducive to obvious or self-evident sound symbols. Instead, I decided to simplify it further, reduce the five shapes to three, and apply simple and consistent rules to manipulate those shapes. So here we are, a curve pointing down, a curve pointing up, and a circle. Simple. These are the nasal stops, and will be the basis of the remaining symbols. Three nasal stops? Yes. Ma, Na, and Nga. Two points to make here. The Nga sound is included so as to facilitate the distinction between that sound in words like hanger and hunger, that is, whether it is followed by a stop consonant or not. Notice that the glyphs are already arranged in a pattern. Each column represents a category of manner of articulation, and each row represents a place of articulation. This is the trend that the other glyphs build on. After the nasal stops, we have the voiced stops, labial ba, coronal da, and laryngeal dorsal ga. We represent these by simply mirroring the starting symbol, similar but different. But how do we flip a circle? Admittedly, you can't, so instead I decided to give it a little tail, or a half column, representing, I suppose, a kind of support for the nga sound. Then the voiceless stops, labial pa, coronal ta, and laryngeal dorsal ka. These are, again, similar but different to the last column. They seem like they're essentially just harder versions of the same sound. Similar, but more intense. We represent this by stacking each symbol atop itself, doubling it. Here the voiceless laryngeal dorsal, that is, k, loses its tail again. Lastly, we have the fricatives and approximants. That means labial wa, or rather wa, coronal sa, and la, that's two sounds, take note, and laryngeal dorsal ha. Here we bring in that column again, but this time it's a full column, first on the left of the symbol, and if we need another symbol, on the right. But hang on, a lot of these sounds aren't that international. That's right, but given that each sound is so fairly distinct, most of them have multiple different options for pronunciation. Essentially, the only pronunciation guides are, so long as it's distinct and intelligible, it is correct. As such, the wa functions both as wa, va, and a slight fa. And sa functions as sa, tha, and various sha-like sounds. La and ha are kind of interesting, as they both cover different types of rhotic sounds, where la covers various retroflex, tapped or trilled rhotics, and ha covers laryngeal dorsal rhotics, such as ra and ra, as well as a wide spectrum of ha-like velar and uvular fricatives. 
This should allow any given phonology to apply roughly to this language. If you speak, say, Japanese, you needn't distinguish between LA and a tapped or trilled RA sound. And if you can't roll your RAs, simply pronounce it as a LA instead. Likewise, if you're Spanish, you might have a hard time with HA sounds. So simply substitute a HA sound like that of a Spanish J. In all secrecy, there are three more symbols, but their only function is in proper nouns and names, which are translated or transliterated phonetically, necessitating a finer distinction between sa and za, between ha and ra, and between va and fa. And there we go. From a simple shape to 13 or 16 fairly distinct consonants. If this were an abjad, That'd be all we needed, and while it was designed to be able to function as such, it's not its main purpose. As such, we need some sonorous sounds to put in between the consonants. And I do mean literally between the consonants. Other than Hangul, a major inspiration for the orthography was Sanskrit, because of its beauty and style, and the idea of a pseudo abugida or a kind of abjad, like Arabic or Hebrew, but with mandatory diacritical vowel marks. Through those, along with Tolkien's Elvish Tengwar, I ended up deciding that vowels should function as a kind of diacritic, marked above or below, besides or sometimes inside consonants. As such, we can use the simple placement or position of the vowel symbols to convey information, specifically about syllabic stress or emphasis. For simplicity, consonant vowel pairs or vowel consonant pairs are read in the direction of reading. Unless otherwise specified, that means from left to right and from top to bottom. That means that a vowel symbol above a consonant precedes it. I call this a proximal position because it is closer to the reader in a sense. Um, this is also one of the two emphatic positions. If a vowel symbol appears beneath or inside a consonant, it comes after the consonant. I call this a distal position, ma. This position is always unemphatic, that is, unstressed. But what if a word ends in a stressed vowel? Then that vowel must take a distal, emphatic position, next to the consonant according to the direction of reading, ma. Conversely, a word beginning with an unstressed vowel must take a proximal, unemphatic position before the consonant according to the direction of reading. Um. Mama. Mama. Amam. Amam. Note that while I use a very classically European method of syllabic stress for emphasis, any sort of emphasis is valid, such as tonal distinctions. The key is the distinction itself and the intelligibility of that distinction. Now that you understand the concept of vowel positions, let's take a look at the vowels themselves. They are O, A, and E. This little dot represents O. This little smile is A, and the long stroke is E. There's also this little short stroke, which is the schwa mark, that only sort of counts as a vowel, and it's really just there for clarity. It also can't be emphasized, and it doesn't appear in diphthongs. Right, diphthongs. We have three vowels, not counting schwa, and all combinations are allowed. Forming a diphthong is quite simple. You simply arrange the vowels according to the direction of reading. That is, unless otherwise specified, left to right, top to bottom. So we have O, A, and E. Two O's become U, or WO. O and A become WA. O and E become OI, A and O become AO, two A's become E or A, and A and E become I. Lastly, E and O become YO, not O. E and A become YA, and finally, most interestingly, if you ask me, two E's become YE. A, or most commonly, E. That makes 12 vowels total, 13 counting the schwa, but even more so than with the consonants, the reader need only learn three basic shapes to get the gist of the rest.
And as mentioned before, the schwa only exists for clarity. Both monothongs and diphthongs are free of orientation, meaning their basic shapes can be rotated freely and still mean the same thing. This is partly for aesthetic reasons, uh, and partly to make it easier to write by hand. Just remember the direction of reading when writing diphthongs. Notice that while some diphthongs have more than one pronunciation, and both pronunciations are technically valid, in a hypothetical use scenario, these distinctions are designed to even out and fall to speak a consensus eventually, while perhaps still being somewhat contextual. In the compendium, I justify the various pronunciation suggestions based on a syllable's placement within a word, and with that, let's get into phonotactics. The most important phonotactic rule is this. If you're having trouble with a consonant cluster, insert a schwa. This is called the auxiliary schwa. It is always unstressed, and it allows any given written consonant cluster to be pronounced as a pseudo-syllable. With this in mind, it becomes clear that the schwa mark, the short stroke we talked about earlier, isn't always entirely necessary. Only some lexemes actually contain a distinguishing schwa, and as such, they are marked differently in romanization. That said, if you can pronounce a given consonant cluster with ease, you're very welcome to. Certain clusters naturally invite pronunciations that aren't usually found in Germanic or Romantic languages, which I like to think emphasizes the intended internationality. Kla, 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 mba, nda, nga, tsa, sra, dra. Ultimately, in a hypothetical use scenario, these pronunciation differences would likely level out and reach some consensus. Instead, let's look at some consonant vowel pairs. Most consonant vowel pairs should be fairly obvious. You take your consonant, m, mm, and your vowel, a, ah, and put them together, ma. Of course, not every sound is created equal. Let's look at the voiced and unvoiced stops along with the diphthongs that start with e. Pia, pia, via, or fia. Ja, cha, nya. Nya, gya, kya. Sha, ja, jra. Again, the only real rule is to keep it distinct and intelligible, and preferably consistent. I mentioned some of my inspirations earlier, Hangul, Sanskrit, Abjads, but up until now I've only presented the simple glyph characters. Let's change that. Much better. Notice the very Sanskrit-inspired horizontal line at the top of each consonant. While this was initially an aesthetic choice, I discovered that it greatly increased differentiation between which vowels are above and which are not above a consonant. It also reduces the area needed to write, in that spaces between words can be indicated by a break in the line, rather than a full space. Now that the orthography is a bit nicer to look at, let's do some grammar. Much like the orthography, the grammar was subject to several iterations. I wandered back and forth between very strict and wide inflections for both verbs and nouns, and even adjectives, and simpler particle indication systems more akin to many Creole languages. In the end, I did decide on a limited set of cases and liberal use of simple particles. Let's take a look at them starting with pronouns. There are six different kinds of pronouns. The most interesting are the first-person plural pronouns and the different third-person pronouns. Firstly, first-person plural, that is, we, us, has two different kinds depending on context. They are both formed by adding the plural indicator particle, we, before a first-person pronoun. The distinction comes down to clusivity, that is, who in context are we. We o refers to the speaker and the speaker's associates or friends, but not the listener. We ni, or simply we, refers to the speaker and the listener. 
Notice that the substitution of we is not taken from Germanic languages, rather it is a considered contraction of the plural particle we and the pronoun e. As such, we ni could be considered an emphatic version of the same pronoun. If one is ever confused about which form to use, exclusive or inclusive, I find that it's probably good manners to use the inclusive form. Then of course, there are the second person pronouns, ko and ka, and plural, wiko, wika. The ko, ka distinction may suggest gender or some such, but this is not the case. Rather, it is a weak form of vowel harmony. You simply use whichever one is simpler to say in context of what you're saying. If you're moving from or to a syllable with an o, you use ko, and similarly with ka for a syllable with an a. In the case of e, i, or ye, well, you do you. These are essentially considered different pronunciations of the same word. Next, the third person general, si, we si, meaning of course he, she, it, and they. The last two are also third-person pronouns, but they're a bit more complicated. We have wa, we wa, which basically means this, this one, these. That is, something near to or held by the speaker. Conversely, we have wo, we wo, meaning that, that one, those, ergo something far away from the speaker or held by the listener, or rather, the one who the speaker is speaking to. Furthermore, wa and wo can be used to specify references to grammatical elements that could, in at least many Indo-European languages, be quite ambiguous. As such, wa can be added to another pronoun or used on its own to refer to the subject of a sentence, whereas wo can be used to refer to the object, direct or indirect. Think of the sentence, it gave it its clothes where it can refer to either the subject it or the object it. In Denam we would clarify this by saying it gave wo was clothes, if it is the subject's clothes, if the clothes already belong to the object, it gave wo was clothes. Those are the pronouns. Notice that they aren't declined for case or number, everything is done with particles. The plural particle we functions for pronouns as well as nouns. Instead of cars, we would say we car. Given the simplistic grammar, that phrase we car could be interpreted as we are driving a car. So how do we make the distinction? There are a couple of ways. The first most basic way is using a verb indicator particle. There are two verb indicator particles, ki for the active voice and ku for the passive voice. The verb itself is never conjugated. Beyond the verb indicator mark, we can introduce tenses with the particle me. A quick note here, me is the only particle with perfect vowel harmony. It always adopts the basic non-vowel form of the vowel nearest to it in the verb it describes. To understand this, let's talk about how it works. If there is no tense marker, the present tense is assumed. If the tense marker comes after a verb, this indicates the past tense. Likewise, if the particle comes before the verb, it indicates the future tense. This is true for both active and passive voice. So, if the particle comes before a verb, it adopts the verb's first non schwa vowel, mekistil, counted or has counted. If the particle comes after a verb, it adopts the verb's last non schwa vowel, Kistil me, will count or going to count. Another kind of verb indicator are the imperative particles. Tama indicates active imperative, while tana indicates passive imperative. For all of these forms, we assume the indicative mood, that is, we assume that what we're talking about is factual, truthful, matter of factly so. To indicate otherwise, we need to use the subjunctive particle ta. The subjunctive mood indicates things like counterfactuality, uncertainty, or desire. A sentence like I might leave or I want to leave would be translated using the subjunctive mood as what I think he left. Here the English auxiliary verbs might, 
want or think are made superfluous. There are two further forms, the Gerund, which uses the particle to, and the agent noun particle, which uses the particle we or well. Gerunds don't work quite as they do in English, taking more inspiration from Greek and Pidgin languages. That is, a gerund is used to make a verb form that indicates the performance of the action of that verb. In English, you would think of a walking stick as a stick used to help you walk. And in Am, a walking stick would be interpreted as a stick that walks on its own, or a stick for the people who walk. To be quite honest, I'm not sure what this object is in reality, but it serves as a good example. With this logic, we can create a lot of more complex terms from simple verbs. Furthermore, gerunds can assume the grammatical function of any element, a verb, a noun, or an adjective, by simply adding the relevant particles along with the gerund particle, to. Let's take an example in the noun, kikistis, to count or calculate. To say he is counting, or he counts or calculates, we simply say, sikikistis. What kind of person just sits around counting and calculating? Mathematicians or accountants? So, our subject is a mathematician, let's say. To express this, we simply say, sitokistis. Notice there is no verb for is. The copulative to be does not occur explicitly and is always assumed to be implicit between a subject pronoun or noun and its descriptive noun or adjective. In other words, the sentence, he is a mathematician, sitokistis, is literally translated as he mathematician, or even more literally, he calculation performing party. If a geron form of a verb is still unclear in some contexts, such as tokistis, which could also mean an electronic calculator or a computer, one could use the agent noun form or its passive counterpart, the patient noun form, with the particle we or well. The distinction between the two we and well is entirely based on the speaker's personal preferences, and the two are completely interchangeable. The distinction between active and passive voice is made through the verb indicators we discussed earlier, ki and ku. Unlike the gerund, the agent noun form always refers to an active performer, which will likely be a person or at least a living being, and as such it is good form to use a relevant pronoun as a pseudo-article. So we can form the argument sikikistis well, meaning he is a calculator, or rather he is one who performs calculations, i.e. a mathematician. We can also use the passive voice to our advantage, sikikistis well, it is calculated, meaning a calculation or the result of a calculation. These various distinctions allow us to recycle the same lexeme to mean different things based on its basic form, indicated by a variety of particles. As such, most lexemes will have associated but distinct verb forms, noun forms and adjective forms, sometimes also forms as particles, pronouns or prepositions, as well as occasional specific gerund forms as either or both verbs, adjectives, and nouns. Speaking of, nouns have four basic forms. All the forms utilize a relevant pronoun, but this may not always be necessary to get across what you mean. The subject form has no particle other than the pronoun. You simply use the pronoun as a pseudo-article and then the noun. Sikistil, meaning the number. Vakistil meaning this number, and Vokistil meaning that number. The subject is the actor or agent of a verb, and that verb may take an object, that is, an element that is acted upon. We indicate this with the direct object particle, do. This is used to indicate the direct object of a transitive verb. But not all verbs are transitive, some are intransitive and yet still take an object, we call this an indirect object, and it's simply indicated using a relevant preposition. In English, these are words such as in, with, toward. These forms mirror basic cases of European languages, nominative, accusative, and dative or ablative. That leaves the genitive case or the possessive case, 
words like his, hers, my, your. To indicate these kinds of relations, we use the particle sa, si sa qui style, belonging to the number. So now we have tenses, moods, person, and number for verbs, as well as declensions for nouns. We can start putting together simple sentences. Let's start with a weird one. Generally, the word order is SOV, subject, object, verb, except for indirect objects, which come after the verb. We write this as SDOVIO. The sentence is Que qui style, bodu qui style, qui qui style, resa qui style, meaning the number counts the number's number. This is a fairly ambiguous sentence in English. Let's unpack the original sentence. We qui style, this number, the one over here, which is the subject. Wodu qui style, that number, which is a direct object. Already the two are distinct. Qui qui style, count, with no particle other than the indicative verb particle. We can then assume it is performed by the subject, so we'll translate it as the number counts. Wesa qui style, belonging to the number. But which number? Well, we number, of course. Meaning the number that is also the subject of the verb, this number. You might have already noticed that I pronounce the same lexeme in two different ways. When a lexeme is a noun, an adjective, or an adverb, the stress or emphasis falls on the very last non schwa vowel, qui style. When the lexeme is a verb or a verb form, such as gerund or agent patient noun, the emphasis falls on the second to last non schwa vowel, qui style. So in speech, we can differentiate quite easily between a word that is a verb and a word that is not a verb. If you remember from earlier, we use the position of the vowels in our orthography to indicate syllabic emphasis. As such, we can make the same distinction quite easily in writing, which I hope would increase reading comprehension. As such, with all of these particles, there is a lot of redundant information. Sometimes that redundancy is a good thing, such as with a beginning or a learning speaker, but it also creates more work to pronounce and write. In a hypothetical use scenario, a lot of these particles would gradually fade out or only be used in clarifying circumstances, in favor of even simpler forms deduced from word order and syllabic emphasis. To be sure, the indicative verb indicator particle key is not always necessary, given that a verb is also indicated by the placement of its syllabic emphasis. Likewise, a gerund will be obvious in that it sounds like a verb in terms of syllabic stress, but takes the syntactic position of a noun. So the gerund particle, ta, may not always be necessary. Likewise, in conversation, once the subject of a conversation has been established, pronouns may in certain circumstances be omitted entirely. As such, as I somewhat erroneously said earlier, the lone pronoun particle, we, may not always refer to the first person plural in context. The key word is context. If ambiguity arises, knowing and mastering the simple particles can quickly eliminate it. In a hypothetical use scenario, a native or even just a trained speaker would almost naturally sense when disambiguation would be necessary or helpful, and when it wouldn't. The last grammatical function we'll look at are the adjectival forms, of which there are five. Positive or basic form, van, such as English, good. Comparative, wun, such as English, better. And superlative, ben, such as English, best. There are two diminutives that function as a simple way to form antonyms without needlessly expanding vocabulary. The diminutive le, le, or li, such as English less, and the negative or superlative diminutive ban le, ban le, or ban li, such as English least. There is also the negation particle, which can work in conjunction with any of the other adjectival form particles. 
I call them adjectival forms and their main purpose is to function as English or est and such for adjectives and adverbs which is achieved by placing the particle directly before the adjective it describes. Buntenau Quicker or faster. Bantenau Quickest or fastest. But the adjectival forms can also be used to create hypernyms for nouns or even troponyms for verbs by placing the particle after the lexeme. Lanka, a stream of water. Lankaben, a great river. Osele, to walk. Oseleben, to run. Again, context is important. If the subject of conversation is the river, it might not be necessary to use the superlative continuously. Likewise, the positive or basic form particle, van, is mainly used for clarification in situations where adjective noun distinctions could be ambiguous. So far, we've used a few vocabulary terms as examples. Lanka, Osel, Kistil. Let's take a quick look at how I've been producing lexemes. Originally, I wanted to create lexemes by reconstructing a form of proto-language through the comparison of semantically similar reconstructions from a variety of reconstructed proto-languages such as Indo-European, Sino-Tibetan and Afro-Asiatic proto-languages. It quickly dawned on me, however, and it was just too much work. Looking up every term in three or five different dictionaries, matching up or averaging out phonetics, it'd be a real ordeal. I'd uh, still like to use this concept in the future, perhaps for another language, but I think the best way to do it would be to automate some of the process. Instead, I decided to divide words into categories of words by topic or grammatical function, and as evenly as possible distribute those categories across different language families. When I did suspect a certain overlap, however, I sometimes did revert to the original idea of matching up or averaging out phonology. For the most part, however, the method was much simpler. I considered the meaning of the intended lexeme and considered which category best suited it. Then it is a simple case of looking that meaning up in a relevant dictionary and serving the results. Then I would simply take one of the results and first off I'd attempt to reduce the consonant clusters by introducing vowels. Then I'd attempt to arrange said vowels in, along with occasional schwas in a way that might preserve the original word's syllabic emphasis in at least one pronunciation of the lexeme. So far as possible, I tried keeping every lexeme between two and five syllables long, not including auxiliary schwas. I would then attempt to pronounce the lexeme, shifting the emphasis to test out different forms. If I'm happy with the pronunciation, I can then begin to derive separate verb meanings from nouns or noun meanings from verbs, as well as adjectives and adverbs, and the occasional gerund. With this method, we end up with a word like osede, which, depending on context and pronunciation, can mean to walk or to run, to go somewhere, as a noun, foot or leg, even shoe, as an adjective, foot-like, meaning flat a gerundium noun form meaning runner or athlete, and an adverbial form meaning while moving or on the way. The ambiguity of these semantic distinctions is essentially a test case for ambiguity in general. It may turn out that I would have to design a language differently to avoid such ambiguity while recycling lexemes. I do, however, both believe and hope that I've moved closer to achieving the goal of simplicity. As of the time of writing, the compendium contains a glossary of some 300-odd lexemes, about half of which I believe have upwards of five or six different grammatical functions and subsequent semantic values. Doing a bit of loose math, that's somewhere between 700 and 1,000 different English words, not accounting for synonyms. From 300 to 1,000, that easily. The recycling of lexemes turns out to be good time management as well. I hope you've enjoyed this showcasing. If and when this video is out of date, I'll be sure to mark it as such in the video title or description. The video description should also have a link to a download of the compendium containing the lexeme glossary, a short overview of the grammar, 
and a section on orthography, typography, and pronunciation. If you have any questions or suggestions, please leave a comment or contact me on Twitter. Thank you for watching.